Memphis, Tennessee, February 9th, 2008. James Hawkins Sr. was known to do the bare minimum for his children, of which he fathered 20, temporarily forgetting. Occasionally, he would buy clothing, pay rent, on which one of his children were staying, but he would sit there in court. He came to support his namesake, James Hawkins Jr., who was looking at doing some very hard time. Hawkins Sr. did not know that his own sordid past would come to light. To save his son's actions and to give his son a future, he might have found out he pretty much ended his own future. And now, this story begins. High school sweethearts that dated on and off drifted apart. They would find one another again, and they would rekindle their relationship. Charlene Gaither, 28, would meet up with her old boyfriend, James Hawkins Jr., 28. Years would fly by, and at this time, they would have three children together, two sons and one daughter, and they would drift apart again. James Hawkins Jr. was absent out of Charlene and their children's lives for years. At this time, Charlene was living in Covington, Tennessee, 40 miles away from Hawkins Jr. in Memphis. She was working at an adult developmental center where she had a great reputation. She was motivating and extraordinary, her co-workers would say. She had been married to Melvin Gaither for about four years now. I will go out on a limb and say I do believe that he was helping to take care of his three stepchildren who were very young at the time. James had started calling Charlene. On October 18th, 2007, Charlene would abruptly move out, leaving her husband and taking her three children with her, now ages 12, 11, and nine. She would move into a small apartment back with James in Memphis. It wasn't that short of a time span. It had to be a little over one month. Charlene began to notice her 12-year-old daughter, I will refer to as KT, was a little too close with her father. She said Hawkins Jr. was a little too flirty with his daughter. On Thanksgiving 2007, again, only a little over a month and a half being with Hawkins Jr. She would go and celebrate Thanksgiving with her father at her father's sister's house. Charlene had always been close to her dad and he could sense that something was really weighing in on her. Charlene and KT seemed to keep to themselves, not speaking to any of the family members, which was not normal behavior. Charlene would confide in her father. She wanted to know, was it natural for a child to be so drawn to their father? Her father, Louis Irving, basically told her she probably just missed her dad. He had been absent from her life for a very long time. Irvin had little contact with his daughter after Thanksgiving. He would soon find out his own daughter was going through a lot. Charlene's relationship with Hawkins Jr. was deteriorating right before her eyes, and her daughter's relationship with her father was escalating. It wasn't right. It was eerie. It stayed on her mind. She'd only been back with this man for three months now. They verbally argued about everything, every day, all the time. You knew it bothered her a lot when she would call her now ex-husband, Melvin Gaither. 
You know, the one she abruptly left. I always wondered about this. Did her husband know she was leaving and returning back to an ex-boyfriend? Was it a big secret? Did her and Hawkins Jr. plan this behind her husband's back? So, they would meet on Christmas Day. They had dinner, they enjoyed a movie, and Charlene would say what was on her mind. She told him that Hawkins Jr. had been threatening her life. Melvin told her to leave. Now, this was only three months in. Did she feel her kids needed to grow up with their biological father? What did Hawkins Jr. promise her? What made her just leave her marriage? The day after meeting with Melvin, that would be December 26, 2007, KT would suffer a miscarriage. She had been 10 weeks pregnant. Charlene didn't know her daughter was pregnant. I don't even think she thought her daughter was even sexually active. She was 12. This would definitely confirm her suspicions, I would think. KT would tell the medical staff it was a boy her age at school and it was consensual sex. And she refused to talk about it anymore and provide any more details. On January 5th, 2008, 10 days after the miscarriage, she would call her ex-husband, Melvin Gaither, again. She would tell him repeatedly that Hawkins Jr. was going to kill her. He would suggest again that she leave. On January 12th, 2008, one week after the miscarriage, an officer, Nancy Trottam, from the Memphis Police Department responded to a call at 3461 Wingood Circle. Charlene was standing outside the apartment with her two sons. She would tell the officer that she and her sons were leaving and she wanted her daughter to come with them, but KT wouldn't come. She told the officer she believed that something inappropriate was going on with her living boyfriend, which was her daughter's father. The officer would speak with Hawkins Jr. He was very cooperative, polite, and calm, the officer noted. She spoke to her daughter in another room. She described her daughter as very quiet and soft-spoken. She would tell Charlene that she wouldn't be removing the daughter from the home. Charlene became very upset about this. She kept repeating that something inappropriate was going on with Hawkins Jr. and her daughter. But there were no custody arrangement agreements and the officer found no signs of domestic abuse against a child or otherwise, so there was nothing that she could do. Charlene would meet another ex-husband, Milton Harris, at a local pizza hut with her two sons. She was hysterical that she had to leave KT with her father. She would echo the words again she believed something inappropriate was happening. The next day, Melvin did speak with Charlene over the phone, and he said her daughter was with her. Now, several days after the meeting at Pizza Hut and the phone call, Charlene would show up to Milton Harris. This is her first ex-husband. She showed up to his job with all three of her children. She was extremely terrified saying Hawkins Jr. was going to kill her. She just wanted to leave him. He gave her keys to an apartment in Memphis that he had a lease to. He also gave her money to file a restraining order against Hawkins Jr. On January 15, 2008, Charlene would go to Citizens Dispute, a government agency to get help with filing and filling a protection order. 
She listed that on January 12, 2008, he pulled her hair. When she said that she wanted to leave with her children, they got into an altercation. She listed she believed Hawkins Jr. and his daughter had been sleeping in the same bed. Even though they both denied having sex with each other, she wanted Hawkins Jr. to just stay away. She wanted a ex parte order of protection, which is usually served the same day. It was never served. So basically, Hawkins Jr. never received it. The case was closed by the end of the month. On January 16th, 2008, the victim met again with Melvin Gather, her second ex-husband. Charlene was by herself. She told him that Hawkins Jr. was threatening her and the kids would not leave with her. Melvin Gaither did not hear from her again. On February 12th, 2008, Hawkins Jr. would call the police. He reported his wife was missing. Officer Kimberly Houston was dispatched. When she arrived, all three of the children were taking groceries out of the trunk. The vehicle was later identified as a vehicle that Charlene drove, but it was registered to her ex-husband, Melvin Gaither. The officer asked to speak to Hawkins Jr. inside his apartment. He agreed, noting mothballs were scattered outside his front door. She asked him why. Hawkins Jr. said it was to keep the neighbor's cats away. The officer also noted that the apartment next door to Hawkins Jr., the front door was slightly ajar. She asked who lived there. He responded, it was vacant. Before even getting close to his front door, the strong smell of bleach laminated in the air. In the apartment, it was even stronger. The smell of bleach and aroma was so strong, the officer's eyes began to tear up. She had to stay by the front door with the door open. Hawkins Jr. said one of his kids had spilled a bucket of bleach. The apartment was small, so the officer was able to see everything standing by the front door. Hawkins Jr. said he added ammonia to try to get the bleach smell out. The officer watched as the children put up the groceries. She would ask Hawkins Jr. questions about Charlene's disappearance. Hawkins Jr. said Charlene left three nights ago. They got into another altercation, and those were the words that he used, altercation. He said it wasn't unusual for her to leave, but she would always come back. She had left after 9 a.m., never came back or answered his calls. He had grown concerned and called the police. He couldn't describe the clothing that she left in. The officer asked the children. No one knew what their mother was wearing. The officer noted the daughter appearing to look angry. She asked her, was she okay? She answered yes and went back to putting away groceries, but slamming cabinet doors, the refrigerator door. Then the girl eventually went into another room with her brothers. Hawkins Jr. could not even describe the color of the vehicle that Charlene had left in. The daughter was called back into the room by the officer. When asked what color of the car her mother left in, she described it as dark, but didn't know the make or model or anything else about the car. The officer asked, did he call 
any of her family members or friends to see if she was even there. Hawkins Jr. said he knew none of Charlene's friends or family's telephone numbers. He added on the 9th he called her and Charlene asked him not to contact her anymore. He even said he tried to call earlier. No one answered. The officer asked for the number and tried to call herself. The phone was now disconnected, which was confusing to the officer because Hawkins Jr. had said he had called earlier and it was ringing. The officer stated he was still calm, polite, just confused. He couldn't give her straight answers for anything. He didn't even have answers to any of the questions she asked. The officer would put a broadcast out for Charlene over the CB, giving descriptions of height and weight, a black and or African American female, dark colored car, missing. The officer would file the missing person's report. Her supervisor reprimanded her about why she filed it. The officer would tell her everything on the scene was wrong. It didn't seem right. The officer's suspicions were confirmed on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2008. Mississippi Department of Transportation would find a body of a black female, Jane Doe, with the limbs cut off. The head and the neck was also removed. The authorities would get a bronchial swab from Charlene's mother, and the DNA proved that Jane Doe was Charlene Gaither. A Lieutenant Armstrong would call Hawkins Jr. and ask could he come to the office. They needed additional information on Charlene Gaither's case. He had not been told a body confirmed as Charlene Gaither had been removed. Hawkins Jr. became very defensive. He said, quote, is it necessary for me to come downtown, unquote. The lieutenant thought that that was very odd behavior about a man who was missing a loved one. Hawkins Jr. explained he was at work and he couldn't get off until three or four. He told him he would give him a call later. Officers were sent to the Nike warehouse where Hawkins Jr. was employed at. They were looking for the vehicle but that Charlene was driving, but it was not there. The lieutenant would call again. Now Hawkins Jr. was saying he couldn't come. He was at home, but he had no one to watch his kids. The lieutenant offered to arrange to have a family member watch the kids. He still refused to come. Several officers would ride downtown to his apartment. The car was there. They intended to stake out the apartment to see if he would go anywhere. Not long after, the Hawkins got in the car with his three children and pulled out onto the main road. The police would put the blue lights on and pull him over. <laughs> 